good morning. Check one, two. All right, will you pray? Almighty God, sovereign creator of the universe, give us purpose in all we do. Help us to keep our eyes on you, focusing on seeking first the kingdom of God and your righteousness. And as we go about our week, as we go about our tasks, help us to never lose sight of that in the everydayness of our lives, Father, that your kingdom, your glory, your honor, your purposes are all that matter. Turn our eyes and help us to focus on you in all things. Fill us with your spirit, Lord. Empty us of ourselves. Allowing the Holy Spirit to work through us, to love through us, to love you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength, to love our neighbor as ourself. Help us to take every thought captive, guide and direct our every thought. We praise you and thank you. In the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to talk to you a little bit about motive. Motive. What's the reason why we do the things that we do? What's the reason why we choose to do one thing or another? What is the motive behind the purposes of all of the everydayness in our life? As we get up in the morning, what are we thinking about? As we prepare for our day, as we look at, do we, do we, have, do we have a plan for, for the day? Is there, is there a purpose and a plan for the day? And what is that purpose? Is there a plan for the week? Is there a plan for the month? It, do we have a yearly plan? Do we have a five-year plan? And if we do... What are the things that we're thinking about? Are we thinking about how we're going to accomplish some goals that we've set? Maybe there's a, a, a challenge with a relationship. Maybe there's a challenge at work. Maybe there's a challenge at school. Maybe there's something that's going on in our life that, that we need to overcome or that we need to, to figure out how to do it. Maybe we're thinking of maybe retirement is on the horizon. Maybe... Maybe a change in vocation is on the horizon. But as we look at the circumstances of life, as we look at all of the things that are going on in our life, is there an overarching, as believers, as indwelled believers, as, as Christians, is there an overarching thought process of God's design and God's plan in how we motivate ourselves to do the things that we do and how, why we choose what we do moment to moment. What's the motive behind it? You know, as we're, as we're going through this, uh, this study in Romans and as we're, as we're focusing on it being a template for the gospel message, and as, as I speak to you uh, week by week and as I prepare and pray over you and pray over the, the, the messages, I, I just continue to, to return to the, this, this thought process of motive. You know, and maybe, maybe you've had a paradigm shift in, in the past about your, about your walk. Maybe you've had some, some epiphany of, 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 oh, you know, that aha moment where it's like, well, this is, I'm heading down this, this direction in my life, and all of a sudden, the reason why I begin to do the things 
that I do changes. And the reason why I choose to do the things that I do changes. You know, there's a, there's a story that goes, and actually on, on December 4th, 1893, Walter Gowans and Roland Bingham of Toronto, Canada, and Thomas Kent of Buffalo, New York, landed at Lagos, Nigeria. And their aim was to establish a witness among the 60 million people. Their purpose. They, they up uprooted their lives and chose to do this, to witness among the 60 million people of what was then commonly known as the Sudan, an area there in the south of the Sahara between the Niger River and the Nile. So Gowans and Kent died in the first few months. They had all of these plans, right? They're, they're going to go there. They're, they're, they, 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 they prepared their heart. They, they prepared academically. They, they prepared spiritually. They gave everything up, left, and just within a few months, they died. So Bingham returns to Canada, and he forms this council, and he goes back to Africa in 1900. But that attempt was also unsuccessful. So Bingham sent out in 1901 a party that succeeded in establishing the mission's first base at Fatigi. So 500 miles up the Niger River is where this is located. So when these first Sim pioneers landed in Nigeria, Gowans was 25 years old, Bingham was two weeks away from his 21st birthday, and Kent was 23. Kids. Just kids. You know, it's not the multitude of hard duties. It's not the constraint and the contention that advance us in our Christian course. It's not that. It's the unyielding of our wills without restriction, without choice, to tread cheerfully every day, not knowing what's on the horizon, but purposefully Seeking first the kingdom of God, friends. Wherever his providence leads us. Wherever, where, whatever, what. To seek nothing. To be discouraged by nothing. To seek out duty in the present moment. Think about that. Seeking out duty in the present moment. You ever stop and reflect? You know, we run so hard. We run so fast. We've got so much going on in our lives. Like, God, you just go, 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 go. And you feel guilty if you have a chance to sit down and, and you're sitting there with nothing to do for a second, maybe, and you're like, I feel guilty. But in the present moment, to trust all else without reserve to the will and the power of God. So they know. Yeah. You know, we need to understand that despite the fact that we are justified and put right in right relationship and made perfect God's, by God's grace, that's not a license to just negate God's law. And we think of God's <coughs> law as, as the rules and regulations and, and, and being, a, being a better Christian, being sinning less. Like we're going to stand at the beam of seat and, and there's going to be a tally of, of you know, how, how many times that we, we chose not to commit a sin versus the times that we, we chose to commit the sin. Friends, when we look at the, the parable of the talents, when we look at the, the way that that, that that is framed up, it's an account of what's been given to us and what we did with it. And what drives that, friends, is our motive. So our goal today is to realize that our position in Christ frees us up. Frees us up to fulfill his purposes. You know, uh, Paul's purpose in writing the, uh, the epistle, he, he writes it to strengthen the Roman believers with spiritual favor, to realize some spiritual fruit from them, and to be strengthened by them. So we're actually wrapping up chapter 3 today. So if you want to turn with me to Romans chapter 3, I'll finish up the chapter beginning in verse 27. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. 
By what kind of law? By a law of works? No. <laughs> but by the law of faith. For we hold that no one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You know, if, if you just kind of gloss over that, it sounds really confusing. Because he's like back and forth with law and faith, and, he, and he's like, it sounds like he's negating the law, and then all of a sudden it's not negating the law and so forth. So I've spent a good amount of time unpacking this. So please lift up a, a, a quickie prayer for me right now that, that I'm able to unpack it for you and just make it really simple. Because there's a lot of meat on those bones. So Paul explains that God's elect boast cannot boast concerning their ability to keep the law. Because you see, in order to do so, we have to keep the whole law. And you remember, as many times as I've referenced the law, and you'll notice on the PowerPoints that I capitalized the T and the L, the law is referring to the sacrificial system. <clears throat> so way back when God began to dialogue with Abraham and, and on to Isaac and, and Jacob, and then you have the Israelites that are freed up from their bondage in Egypt and are given the law. It's not just the Ten Commandments, it's those 613 laws and then the verbal laws and all of those things that fast forward up to the Pharisees and walk around with the, you're not supposed to do that, you're not supposed to do this. The law are guidelines, but they're also a, re, a way, a sacrificial system to make up for, to atone for, which they were never supposed to do, the sin, because you would sacrifice animals and shed the blood in order to demonstrate you're sacrificing something that you have. It's something that, that, that they own, that's there, that they're giving up and giving to God to sacrifice. So the sacrificial system is the law. But Jesus is the fulfillment of the sacrificial system, the law. The law of namas. Literally, it is a principle, it's a code, it's a belief, it's a standard, it's a value. So now, plug that into your mind as a Christian. Literally, the code, the belief, <coughs> the standard, the value. It's not just not sinning. It's not just not committing sins, committing <coughs> sins. It's not omitting sins, and it's not doing things for the wrong reason, and it's not doing things for the wrong, with the wrong attitude. Namas, this code, the, the Christian code, is a code of seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness in all that we do, in all that we say, in all that we think, in all that we plan, in everything that we purpose. It's our code. It's our belief. It's our standard. It's our, our, our value of why we do what we do. Everything plugs into that. So it's not just saying, okay, well, you know, I, I used to be foul mouth, or I used to be have a bad temper, or I used to plug in whatever it is that, that, that is your predominant sin. We're all different genetic makeups, and we all have different bends towards different types of sins that we commit. But we also have a, a, a general bend towards towards what we won't do for the kingdom. There's a there, 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 there's a line there. It's like, well, if I do that, then this is going to cost me here. Or if I do that, then I won't be able to do this. Or if I do that, then I'll look like this. And so forth. So omission, sins of omission, sins of commission, sins of wrong motive, sins of wrong attitude, all of those plug into the code. See, because you and I make choices and decisions every day about why we do what we do. And that code is what's being talked about with, the, with, with upholding the namas, the law, the namas. It cannot justify. 
That is not why we do it. It's not the purpose behind why we do what we do. We don't say, well, well I'm going to stand at the beam of seat and I did pretty good. I'm keeping the namox. No. No, that's not the purpose. So the text says that boasting is not in a law of works, but boasting in a law of faith. What does he mean by that? Well, faith, pistis, saving faith. Hebrews 11, 1 talks about it now. Now, faith, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. It's a know that you know that you know that if I believe what God says in my heart, I have faith. I have faith. Assurance. Assurance. Conviction. It is not, I guess so, hope so. So what's the law? What's the law of faith? Well, through, through Paul's use of that word nomos, we see it's a standard set by God. Man is justified by the nomos, by the standard of faith. Well, guess what? Remember what I talked about when we went through Ephesians. Remember I refer back to that. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. We always talk about it. You're saved by grace through faith. And this is not of yourself. It's a gift from God and not by works. Faith is a gift from God. So what? We're justified by the law of faith. Namas, the standard of faith. Not by the namas, the standard of the law. A law of works versus a law of faith. That's figur figurative for avoiding all of those four categories of sin. All fours. Omission, commission, wrong motives, wrong attitudes. All four. So he, he explains that no one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Well, you see, the thing is, I'm doing my best here, friends. Hang with me. So when faith is given to us in the package of grace, when God reaches inside of each one of us and rips out the old nature and replaces it with that new nature, and we are indwelled with the Spirit, we still have a sarx that encases us. That sarx wants to pull us away from what we're called to do. It wants to pull us away from, and, and as, you, as you look at the, the entirety of humanity, man always chooses himself over God. That sarx wants what it wants. It wants to please us. It wants to please self. But that new nature inside of us has freed us up from that. Well, we still have to choose it. You know, our, 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 our friends, the, the, the free willers that say, well, you know, you, you have to choose God. Otherwise, you know, God, God is, is not sovereign. Man is in control of his own choices. Otherwise, God wouldn't be God unless, unless man could, could have free will to choose. Well, man does have free will, friends. Man, man chooses, but man always chooses himself. Always. In every, in every situation, Adam and Eve cho chose themselves. Cain chose himself. Even, even Abraham chose himself. Every situation, every circumstance, and every, every dispensation that, that has ever existed, every stewardship, every oikos that's existed, you'll see it. In, in perfection before the fall, Man chooses himself. Conscience, man chooses himself. Human <clears throat> government, man chooses himself. The law given, man chooses himself. And here we are, indwelled by the Holy Spirit, new nature, free, set free from the bonds of sin, and still we choose ourselves. Oh, God. Interestingly, fast forward to the millennial kingdom. There's Jesus, regenerated Jesus, obviously the God man. All of his angels, saints regenerated with their new bodies, and all the humans on the earth still at the end of the millennial kingdom rebel against God and try to throw overthrow him with, with, with Satan. Humanity always will choose himself. But what has happened is when you and I are regenerated, we have been set free from the bonds of sin and we can choose well. We can choose the right decision to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The law of faith, friends, is the law that has set us free from the bonds of choosing ourselves. We still have to make that choice. 
So the free will is not at the point of salvation, friends. The free will has been given to us as new creation in Christ. Once we have that new nature, now we can choose. Before we could total depravity like we've been talking about for the last three months. A lot of meat on these bones. No one's justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Faith upholds and establishes the law, God's standard. The law has played a vital role by bringing clarity to sin. Breaking the law made it necessary for Christ's actions on earth and on the cross. He paid the price with his blood, with his precious blood. He paid the price. Look at what the text says next there. So, God is the God of both the circumcised and the uncircumcised. Well, that's figurative for Jews and Gentiles. And, and so as, as, as we look at that, we've got to look at the context of that because context is king. Because, <laughs> you know, I, 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 and maybe you're like me and you look at it and say, well, wait a second, I, I thought that uh, the Jews are God's chosen people. So if he says, if he's saying God is God of the Jews and the Gentiles, is he now saying that, that they're no longer his chosen people? That's not what he's talking about, friends. What he's saying here is, First, by the way, Abraham was a pagan. Did you know that? Now, let's think about this, because uh, right around the same time that uh, the stuff's going on with, with Abram, is the stuff that's going on with Job. So Abram's a pagan. Job, according to the Bible, is blameless in God's sight. Why didn't, why didn't God choose Job to be the, the, the patriarch? No, he chose it. But Abraham was a pagan. Because you see, by God's sovereign election, that was his determination, his purpose. It wasn't because Abraham was a better guy than Job. You look at the, the, the two pre, pre God, Job's blameless inside. Abraham messed up a couple of times, made some bad decisions, Ishmael one of them. Still suffering the ramifications of that choice. You know, the. Choices have consequences. They have consequences. But what's happening here is God is the one and only true God. And therefore, what he's saying here in this text is, whether anyone acknowledges him as God or not, he is God. He is God. So when we, when we hear, well, he's the God of, uh, of the Jews and the Gentiles, what it's saying, friends, is God is sovereign over all people, regardless of whether they want to acknowledge him or not. So he says God is one, and he's going to justify both the Jews and the Gentiles by faith. Not by actions, by his sovereign purposes, by his sovereign choice, by reaching inside of that person, ripping out the old nature, replacing it with a new nature, and indwelling that person with the Holy Spirit, and giving them, in that package of grace, faith. Now, each one of us is given a measure of faith. And that word measure, by the way, gives a, 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 an indication of, of a disproportionate amount of faith. So, you might be given a certain amount of faith. You might be given a little bit more. You might be given a lot more. But each one of us is given a measure of faith, but that faith is given to us. And by the way, faith is not salvation. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Salvation is granted to us, and in the package of that is faith. In other words, I believe God. I believe what he says is true. I believe that he, if he promises things, he'll do them. And so he says, I'm going to send my son. I'm going to send Jesus. He's going to live a perfect life. He's going to shed his blood voluntarily as a satisfaction of my wrath on the cross. Rise from the dead to prove that he is God. The God man. And then he's going to ascend into heaven seated see at the right hand of power. He will return. Hallelujah. Maybe these times you're praying for that return to come today. Come Lord Jesus come is what, what Revelation says. And if I believe that. That that is all that is necessary. That is an evidence that I have faith in God's promise to redeem me because of that, those actions, those salvific actions. 
So last week we talked about justification and the justified and the justifier. I'll revisit that. So justified is put with in right standing with God and right standing with him. So we were not in right standing with God. He put us in right standing with him by what he did in us that we could not do. So being just is being morally, ethically a character of rightness. Maybe sometimes you don't feel that way. Oftentimes I don't. I feel like I fall short. I pray to God every day, Lord, make me better than this. Make me better than this. But you know, it's not because I want to feel good about me. You know, you ever, you ever think that? You ever think, you know, you, you look at the things that you've done, the wrong motive. Because you see, the purpose of you and I being who we're called to be is to be God's chosen people. God's chosen people. That means that you and I are lying in a dark place and when people look at us, they need to look at us and say, there is something different about that person. And it's not necessarily because we don't cuss like most of the people that are living in the world nowadays. My goodness gracious. The expletives just fly everywhere in the on TV and everywhere now. I mean, you can't be anywhere without hearing it anymore, right? Or insert whatever. It's not just that. The reason we do that is to draw a distinction between us so that a, purpose, a per person recognizes that in us. And we can speak into their life. Someone says, it's something different about you, and I like it. I want it. Is there something different about us? Are we even noticeably different? What, what's that old adage? If you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? <clears throat> That's why we do it. It's not to feel better. It's not to, to, to sin less. It's to be distinctive between the world so that we're, we're, we're different. God is the justifier. He's the one who makes a person right standing morally, ethically, in rightness with a standard. In this case, by the way, it's perfection. Your new nature has been perfected. When we get our new bodies, our new bodies will be perfected and then we will be completely perfect. Because you see, in order to enter into the presence of God, we must be perfect. Not just better. Perfect. Perfect. By his grace. By his unmerited favor. By his unearned. Something we did nothing to earn. Something that we can do nothing to keep. Something we can do nothing to lose. By his grace. So what does Paul mean? You ever, as you read through this, and I know you've been reading through Romans, because I know I've asked you like for the last few months. Thanks for doing it. Do you ever think, what does Paul mean by overthrow the law? When he says that, he, your brain just go, what? Overthrowing the law, friends, is rebelling against God's standard. When he says overthrowing the law, that's, that, that's just another figurative way of, of rebelling against God's standards. Who you rebelled against God's standards? I have. I have. So believers must still uphold the law. Well, why? Why, why do believers uphold the law? Did you ask that? I'm glad you asked. The greater context of Romans, friends, is going to bear out that we uphold the Mosaic Law as a source of guidance for our life. When we get to chapter 13, when we get to chapter 8, when we get to chapter 13, we're going to see that it is our obligation to uphold the Mosaic Law because of who and whose we are. Not to earn our way into the grace of God. Not to, not to say, see, I'm, I'm good. Because we're not, there's none righteous, no, not one. But we, because we have been set free to do it. 
We can do it. We uphold the Mosaic Law as a standard of God's holiness. Now nullified because of Christ and fulfilled in Christ because of what he did. I need to go back over everything that I just fed you with the fire hose on here because there's a lot of meat on those bones, all right? So there's some comparison, contrast, there's some cause and effect in our passage. So first, we fail if we boast in the law, okay? Well, let me tell you, we do that. We feel good that we, 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 we did better or we, we, we overcame that sin or we avoided that situation. We feel better. Or we do a, a, a good good deed. We feel good about that. Well, that's boasting in the law. In our ability to do things. Works. Okay? But we, we are, are failing if we boast in the law instead of boasting in faith. You see, the thing is, you say, you made that good decision. Lord God. But what he did. Not what I did. Right? That's what he means. So here's another one. Here's an effect cause. See, if I switch it, if I say cause and effect, I'm wrong. So faith is the effect. The cause is justification, meaning put right standing with God. So the effect is faith. Jews and Gentiles, God of both, he's God of all. God's going to justify by faith. And justification is going to play out in our ability to uphold the law. Rather than overthrowing the law, we're going to uphold the law because of what God has done in us. So here's my very, very verbose one main point. So Paul explains that for the believer, there's no boasting in human effort, Jew or Gentile. Man can't keep the law perfectly. Humanity cannot be justified by works or by efforts. Humanity remains only justified by God through faith. Yet, this qualification does not nullify the responsibility to uphold the law. See, that, that's, that's where, we, where we miss the mark. That's where we mess up, is we think that we've got to do these things in order to earn the favor of God, instead of thinking about the fact that we've been set free to be able to do that. And then when, when God works through us that way, Pointing in and saying, glory to God for what he has done in this situation through me. That's the difference. My takeaway, evangelist Fred Brown, maybe you've heard of him. He used three images to, to describe the purpose of, of law. The, the, the first one that he lied into was, was a dentist's mirror. You ever go to the dentist? I've never had to have root canal, thank God. People talk about these harrowing experiences. But they, they get in there, he gets in there with that mirror, right, and he identifies maybe a cavity or a need or, or whatever. But then does he take the mirror and start jamming it into the, no. And some of you that have root canals are like wincing and thinking about <laughs> I'm doing that to you right there, right? But the no, the, the mirror, he doesn't drill with it, he doesn't use it to pull teeth. It shows him the decayed area or the abnormal spot there, but it doesn't provide the solution. Another, another analogy he uses is a flashlight. You know, if, if, if suddenly the lights go out, you, you go, you grab your flashlight, you go down to your fuse box, and you see a blown fuse down there, and of course you've got the trip, but you don't take the flashlight and start smashing it in there trying to, trying to fix the fuse, right? The flashlight just helps you find it. The solution, right? Same thing with a plumb line. You know, use a use a plumb line to to, 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 to get the, the straightness, but you don't use the plumb line to fix the problem, right? Get your get your saw and your hammer out and fix that. The law points to the problem of sin. It doesn't provide the solution. It doesn't provide the solution. Christ. Christ provides the solution. You know, a lot of pastors, when they get up and start talking about sin, they're always talking about commission. Doing better. You know, admit, you know, avoiding this, not, you know, not, not running down this path, not, not committing this, or getting better, you know, this or that, whatever, whatever sin that we have uh, agenda.
general bench or whatever it is and you insert it to each use. But I, I think a lot of times we avoid talking about the sins of omission. Because you see, when we talk about seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, there are, there are things that you and I should be doing for the kingdom. But there's all this stuff in our life that, 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 that keeps us from that. Because you know, particularly as Americans, we want to fill up every second with, with busyness and, and stay busy. And if, we don't, if we're not busy doing something, then we feel guilty uh, uh, about it. But you know, the thing is that being freed up, freeing up our time, freeing up our energy, freeing up all, all allows us to, 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 to reflect and take perspective and look at, at where God may be leading us. You know, immediately, and maybe, maybe you're like me, I'm, I'm like, always wanting to figure out how to solve the problem. And get, get, I, I don't want anything in my mind or in my life that's unresolved. I want it all figured out. I want it all worked through, you know. And, and the Lord, over the course of years and years, praise God for, for him being so, so merciful and so patient with, with, with me to, to learn to just stop. You know, the psalmist says, cease striving and know I am God. Because, you know, his solutions are far better than mine. They're far better. Very difficult for me to pause and allow these things to sit in on you. Cease striving. I know I am God. He's large and in charge. His way is the best way. His purposes will be fulfilled. And he will use you. But you have to choose yourself to have time for him to do it. Enemy wants you boring ahead, running 100 miles an hour, blinders on. Step back. See striving. And know he is God. He's large in charge. One Sunday evening, William Booth was walking in with his son, Bramwell, who was about 12 or 13 years old at the time. And, the, and he surprised him by going into a saloon. You know, the stench of cigarettes and alcohol there, a 13-year-old kid. How many, how many fathers would drag their kid into that situation? How many mothers would be mortified <laughs> to learn that dad took, it, took his kid into there? But here's what he said. Really, these are our people. <clears throat> these are our people. <clears throat> and I want you to live for bringing them to Christ. Years later, Bram Booth said this, the impression never left me. The impression never left me. These are our I want you to lead me to Christ. My friends, may the impression never leave us. So for our daily quiet time, I'll remind you again, please be reading through the entire book of Romans just to get the broader perspective. It's very easy to get myopic with this stuff because there's just so much. And you will isolate faces in your life. Lost people. Write their names down. And pray for their salvation. If it doesn't come through you, that's okay. But pray for their salvation. Pray for the opportunity 
to share your story with them because your story is his story. Will you do it? Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning recognizing the great need. The field is white for harvest. The workers are few. But our God is able to do above and beyond and far away more than we ever could. Infinitely. And so, Lord, as Paul said, I planted the Paulus water, but the Lord provided the increase. But we recognize that there was effort in the planting and the watering. Let us be planters. Let us be waterers in the fields that you've placed us in. Use us in mighty ways that are completely disproportionate to who we are so that you get the glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's that time of invitation. I invite people to come that have never expressed publicly that they believe salvation by faith in Christ. But it's also a Baptist church an opportunity to say, I've got something on my heart, I want to share something, something to say. Or if you just want to unite with us and say, hey, I want to throw my hat in the ring here with y'all, we come forward as we sing our invitation. Sing as we sing. He became a sin.